All right. Uh, Bob, thank you for allowing us to come visit, a, you know, your beautiful home here in Coco. Um, as I mentioned to you, we, we are really driven to preserve the stories of all great icons and Hall of Famers such as yourself. And you are so beloved throughout the fishing community. You know what you've done with fly tying, casting, demonstrations, fishing, smallmouth bass. You are, you're, you're the definition of a true legend and a true icon. And uh, I've always loved you, as many other people have. You know, I was talking to Popovich the other day, and <laughs> the best that people can say is that you're just the most genuine, heartfelt, loving human being they've ever met. And um, I don't remember the first time I met you, and and I don't. I'm not sure the last time I saw you, but if I'm not mistaken, it was at Somerset. The last time I spoke with Lefty was with you on the phone. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Is that the last time we we saw each other? Uh, I think so. Until you walked in that door there this morning, and I was so overwhelmed, I had to give you a big old hug. You wow, know? you're <laughs> you're a beauty, buddy. Um, let's go to Lefty right now, since we just brought that up. Yeah. Do you remember your last conversation with him, and 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 what you both had to say to each other? Yes. Uh, it was on a Thursday evening at 4.30. We had a date set for him to call me. This was one week before he passed on. Uh, at, four, at 4 o'clock, I left my house, and I drove down to the boat landing where we would stick our boat in and fish together. I pulled in a boat landing, and there's a few cars and some boats sitting there, and I'm sitting there waiting for my telephone to charge up. I looked at it, and I said, okay, it's, it's 20 minutes after 4. He don't like being late, never liked being late, so I called him one minute before 3.30. <laughs> Answers the phone. I said, this is Clouser. He said, I know. I can I can recognize that voice anywhere he goes. And he kind of giggled a little bit, and, and I didn't know exactly how to start this. And uh, I said, Lefty, I know you're going on the uh, exploratory trip that none of us have ever went on. And I said, someday I'm going to do that too. I said, but I'll tell you what I would really like to get something into you here that I'm sitting on our favorite area where we put the boat in when you come to Pennsylvania to, to fly fish. Yeah, Bobby, go ahead, he said. And I said, maybe, and I said, we're not going to probably do this right away. I said, but after I take the same trip you did, I said, I hope we get, and I can take my boat along, and we can come back here and fish and fish and fish forever on these waters together in the boat like we've done in the past. He says, Bobby, he said, that would probably be the best deal out of all this. And I said, Lefty, it's fine. I said, I want, I want you to remember something that I felt pretty bad about uh, one day when we were fishing together. But I held my thoughts, and we did okay together with it. I said, you remember the day we're drifting down the Susquehanna and we're throwing flies to rising bass? And we're casting one side of the boat the other, safety involved. And you said to me, Bobby, for God's sake, look, turn around, look at all the bass on that bar out there rising. And I made a quick turnaround and a cast, and I caught the side of your hat with the fly. And I said, I heard it crack. It took that hat off of your head and went 20 feet out into the water. And I said, I was stunned. I didn't know what to say to you. And he said, well, yeah, I know what you said, and it was okay. He said, you pointed to me and said, don't you say anything about that. Look how far that hat went. 
that was some of our last communications uh, that I've had with him. Uh, and it, it's just lasting me forever as a real good friend of mine that's on his journey somewhere. Yeah. Well, he touched, as you have, a lot of people's life yeah. um, lives. Um, he came into my life when we were doing clinics together mm -hmm. uh, in South Florida. I would talk about uh, Tarpon. He'd stay at my, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Chrissy's in my home, and he'd talk about everything else. But, um, well, and I know for sure the smallmouth bass is your favorite fish, as it was lefties. Yeah. And uh, what yeah. was it? What is it about that fish and and that river, which is uh, the longest river in, in Pennsylvania? Um, how do you say that? Susquehanna River. Susquehanna. The Indians' uh, reason for Susquehanna meant wide, shallow, muddy river. But I can understand where the mud come from because it's clear water. It's nice clear water. Right. And what is it about uh, a smallmouth bass? <clears throat> well, if I had to do it today, of what I accomplished in the last 50-some years, I couldn't do it anymore. Because uh, our environment and the amount of people using that resource in Pennsylvania has changed everything on the water, the breeding systems, uh, the pollution coming from big cities and big businesses. Uh, when I was uh, doing all that research and doing my book and stuff like that, uh, I saw more things then than I will ever see in that river in my whole entire rest of my life. I seen fish being born. I watched big sl uh, slugs of smallmouth bass come off a nest. I seen animals, uh, other types of fish, if you want to call, I call them all animals to me, chasing and eating the babies and stuff like that. But there was so many nests that there always was enough survival. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, <clears throat> biggest hindrance to the smallmouth way back then was the size limit that the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission put on that species, uh, it started out to be eight inches. Uh, <clears throat> there was people coming uh, from everywhere fishing that Susquehanna River in the fall. When the fish got to eight and nine inches long, they were taking them out by the stringers. It took us from when we were first fishing that river and we were catching a lot of 18 inch fish. Now we're down into below 12 inches. Mm -hmm. You could see the decrease in size of the fish on that river in the section that I fished. Uh, with some help from the Fish and Game Commission, of course, and, and a lot of talking and time wearing, uh, visits and stuff like that, uh, they did change the size limit. They changed it to 10 inches. Hmm. Uh, 10 inches didn't help. Uh, people were coming there in October stringing up with three and 400 boats. Wow. In that Middletown, Highsbury, Columbia uh, section of river, which is probably eight or 10 miles of water. The size limit never really got above 12 inches. If you caught a 12-inch bass, it made the newspaper. Wow. So then the fishing game finally got someplace up in the 80s, in the in 1980s uh, area. <clears throat> they changed a, a section of 34 miles of the best section in the river to one 15-inch smallmouth bass. Within three summers, our guide service was putting in, I had two boats on that river, and our guide service was putting eight smallmouth bass in the boat a day, 18 to 20 inches long. Oh, wow. Because of that change. Sure. The amount of fishing pressure 
which was blamed on the decline first. The amount of fishing pressure did not hurt the population of those big fish. The people loved it. They kept coming back. They, they took and took that 30 some miles and changed it to 98 miles on the Susquehanna River with the same regulation. And that regulation is still in force today, uh, even with bad water quality. Uh, there's hardly any fish below Harrisburg, but above Harrisburg, they're catching all trophy-sized bass every day someone wow. goes out. That's got to do your heart some good. Oh, it does. it's absolutely the best bass fishery in the world, and maybe not in quantity, but quality. Um, but talk about briefly, that's the river and the evolution of the river. Mm -hmm. Um, um Talk about the smallmouth bass itself. I mean, you've been around the world fishing, mm -hmm. as did Lefty. Yeah. And I know the Lefty says that he caught over 90 different species with your fly designs, yeah. and we'll get yeah. to that in a minute. But yeah. talk about the smallmouth bass. What is it about that fish that no one knows about? <laughs> uh, very, very aggressive. Uh, it's, it's a species that is tuned to take the crippled or the hurt out of the herd. So they call their own family. Yes, they call everything. Anything that's hurt, they eat. Anything that's hurt, they chase and eat. Uh, and the reason uh, that my way of thinking was uh, I had to come up with a fly that we could retrieve like an escaping bait fish. It didn't have to look like the bait fish. Uh, it didn't have to be painted. It didn't have to be anything like that. But when you retrieved it, it had to move like an escaping bait fish. The best thing that I could tell, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of spin fishing here of, of the idea, was that on the Susquehanna River, the jig was the best spinning lure ever invented for smallmouth bass. And I kept fishing them, and I kept looking on how this thing works. Because a jig mostly goes up and down. Mm -hmm. And a, a bait fish pattern, typically when you strip, it goes everywhere. And if you have weight on it, then that too will go up and down. Like yeah, now, now the, the flies that we weighted... actually improved the fly catch tremendously, but they just didn't look right the way we were weighting them and putting weight on them and stuff. But what I found out was at a certain point behind the hook eye, we could have that fly either dart left or right and up and down. It was all in your stripping motion. And in order to strip and move that fly so it was effective, we had to first take the slack out of the fly line. And by pulling the slack meant that you bent down, grabbed the line with a rod tip pointed towards the water, pulled the slack out till you got to your side of your leg, and then you vastly, uh, Lefty called it a speed up and stop type retrieve, where you really rip the fly forward. The fly can only move sometimes six to 10 inches during that whole three foot pull. The reason that most streamers didn't work was they didn't do that kind of stuff. They would hang there and, it, and you'd be pulling slack out and never move the fly because you never really stopped that retrieve with that speed up and stop. Right. The, uh, <clears throat> that was the strip that we named the Susquehanna Strip. That worked. I mean, that put one bass after the other on your fly. And if you watch them flies move, when you erratically tried to take it away from the bass, it would dart all over the place, just like a minnow trying to hide and bury its head in the rock someplace. Right. Uh, we had one, one saying about this, uh, and of course, it was Lefty and I making this remark. Lefty says, Bobby, I got it all figured out. 
I said, okay, tell me. He said, you know what? He said, I'll bet you that bass never met a minnow that stopped and said, go ahead and eat me. Mm. That's the what answer. a great way to put it. That's the answer right there. Yeah. yeah never stopped moving. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I've always felt like that was the similar um, communication I had fishing tarpon with marabou. Because oh, oh, exactly. all those fibers are, yeah. are speaking to that fish, you know, come eat me. I am alive and here I am. Hey, to, today where I live here, the only real good fishing I have left down here is in the, I call it the jungle, is out in the canals, out near the space center. And these are baby tarp, and these are fish from 12 inches to probably 36 at the biggest. We've never caught too many over 30 inches out there, but we get them. Mm -hmm. The faster we pull that fly, erratically, the more tarp and strikes we get. Is that because they're baby tarpon and they're not very sophisticated? Because if I, you do that to a big tarpon, you're never they're gonna they're gonna throw up all over it. I don't know. I caught I caught hundred pound tarpon in Costa Rica by going like catch this fly bud. Yeah, well that's a different yeah. fish, different yeah. fishery. Yeah, uh, and obviously tarpon want to be caught for the most part. <laughs> Yeah. Right? I it's agree. not a very smart fish. I agree. But uh, in the Florida Keys now, in that clear water with these fish swimming over that white sand, um, you've it's a, real, it's a technical game now. It's incredibly technical. <clears throat> the, I think the more that the fly hangs there and pulsates, the probably more effective it is. With bigger fish, especially. Yes. Yeah, yeah. for your larger fish. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go back a little bit, Bob. Um Let's go back to your your youth. What do you what do you remember when you were a child? Because I know that uh, you know you your life con consisted of hunting, fishing, and trapping. Was yeah. that based on your father's hobbies? Yes, yes, yes. And what did your father do professionally? Uh, he was uh, worked at the Olmsted Air Force Base. He was an airplane mechanic. And of course, he had his own business. He was a, a huckster. He had a truck that he would, would go around town selling leads, lettuce and potatoes and stuff like that. Right. And was your, your do you remember your grandfather at all? Was he also no. a hunter or a fisherman? No. I, I, I don't remember any of my grandparents uh, except my dad's mother. Right, she lived to be something like ninety-eight. I guess it was. Yeah, I mean, I I very vaguely remember my grandparents. I mean, they yeah. were really old, and I was really young. Yeah, <laughs> which is typically yeah. the case. That's um, how. <laughs> but, that's but, how it but, was. but what kind of hunting and fishing did your dad introduce you to, and trapping as well? Well, we had uh, trapping on the Susquehanna River and the Swadire Creek. We had tons of muskrats. Uh, our total catch from the family on muskrat trapping, and I remember this one year, we had 800 muskrats that we had skinned. And by the way, uh, they are delicious table fare. If the muskrat was alive in the trap and we had to dispatch him, we ate that muskrat. Wow. Would you compare it with any type of rabbit? Uh, rabbit. rabbit? Okay, yes. so it's a dark yeah. meat. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, mm -hmm. animals are dark meated. Um, but that's let's not forget you're eighty, almost eighty four. So that was seventy years ago. <laughs> that was my a God. long time ago. Uh, my daughter just called me and sent a picture down, and she found a little seven point rack on a plaque. And she said, Dad, is this yours or Bobby's? I said, that's my first buck that I got when I was 17 years old. That was your first, first, first deer? First deer ever shot with a deer rifle. And actually, the rifle was a military grade uh, 30 40 Craig that uh, was original, big, long. And we, I took it to a gun shop and cut it back and and shorten the barrel and actually uh, put a nice stock, new stock on it and stuff like that. Re just rebuilt the gun. 
And was your dad also a smallmouth bass fisherman? He was everything. My dad fed our family with fish and game. Uh, I don't know if you can associate with anybody else, but sometimes our Sunday dinners were delicious stuffed groundhogs. <laughs> yes. Can you imagine that? Delicious stuff. Ground. Is that because you were really hungry? Is no. Is that why be, they tasted good? Beca or? Because he never shot an old hot, an old one. He would, he would go down to some of the meadows. We had thunderstorms. The groundhogs would be flushed out of their holes. Sure. And he would get himself some young ones. Wow. And my mother would stuff them with sausage and potatoes. That's unbelievable. And, and an incredible delicious meal. Crazy. What's the most abnormal meal? Besides that, that you've ever had. I mean, I can't imagine anything more. Chicken. <laughs> Roast chicken. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, but the biggest uh, change of your life, if I'm not mistaken, happened when you were 14 years old and your dad gave you the special gift. <laughs> yes. Do you remember that day? Yes. We used to get one item a year, you know, for gifts. We'd get a baseball one year, basketball one year, a bat another year, you know. And uh, my dad uh, bought this uh, family circle fly tying book and a vice and just a, a regular little kit with a Thompson A vice in it. That lit me up so much for tying and inventing things. Uh, I couldn't put it down. At the end of my career in school, we what we did we had to have some kind of project okay we did this project uh, some of the boys built battery motorized items and things like that and i went over to the five and ten cent store i bought some wooden lays and some white sheets of cardboard i fastened the wooden lays together into a stand and put a, a piece of cardboard up against them. And I sat down that whole year. I tied 175 streamers out of a book that I had, that book, the colors. And sure. Stuff. I tied each one of them, glued it on this cardboard, and wrote underneath the name. I set that up at the end of high school in the auditorium. And I got an honorable mention, which really gave me the go to do some more of that. So that's when you became a fly tire. Yes. That's when I wanted to do everything I could with the flies. And uh, I cut grass at two elderly people's homes in town to buy a true temper metal extendable fly rod out of Kern Sporting Goods store. How long did it take you to earn that? Uh, About three months. Three months of cutting grass. I remember, too, um, Ernie Schwiebert mm -hmm. in Aspen taught me how to fly cast. Mm -hmm. When I was nine years old, I'm going to baseball <laughs> practice. I see this fly line going across space, and I went over, and then Chuck Fothergill, you may remember his name. Yes. He taught me how to fly tie. Uh, or tie flies, and I, I, you know, I tied for quite a while, like maybe two summers, just earning enough money to buy my first hardy reel. Yeah. But it's interesting how both of us, at a very young age, did these chores, yeah. you know, to to purchase our things. And oh, I remember yeah. too, you know, cutting grass and shoveling snow in the winter time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, but how? I mean, at that point, were you fishing much? A little bit with your dad? I mean, how did all of a sudden your dad think in a fly time uh, vice and feathers would really whet your appetite at that time? I, I don't know. I think he just wanted to keep me home so I wouldn't get in trouble <laughs> outside, you know. Uh, he, he, on the weekends, he would uh, drive over to the Yellow Breaches Creek and he would fish for trout. 
Okay, now he, he had some flies. He wasn't really in tuned into the fly fishing part of it. But I watched him on after a thunderstorm catch 28 inch long brown trout under bridges wow. along the piers. And you know what he caught them on? And I'm not ashamed to say it night crawlers. Drifting. He taught me about the nymph fishing style that we call it today mm -hmm. of dead drifting uh, the live bait. He said if it's not drifting right, they're not going to pick it up. Right. And he would adjust weight on his leader. He would adjust things. And and then I could see the, the line just stop dead. He'd hold on to it for a second or two and pick it up and get himself a big brown trout. So 70 years ago, he was probably cutting edge, yeah. cutting the edge nymph fishing. As, as far as nymph fishing, yes. It had to be right. Even with a real live bait, the drift had to be right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I learned that off of him uh, on how to do that when I would take and make the muskrat nymphs and stuff like that. You were possessed to tie flies. <laughs> not guess. Probably, probably more so than to fish, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. I do both, though, but I mean... I mean, do you st does what keeps you awake at night when you're younger? Uh, fly designs or yeah, fishing? Yeah. <clears throat> What's it take to become? Lefty to used to tell me when he he was teaching me to write, and he was teaching me all kind of stuff. And he'd say, "Bobby, if you think about it at three o'clock in the morning, you better get up and write it down, or go into your typewriter and write it down on the typewriter." because you're not going to think of that anymore. And he's right. I went to bed with my mind just of going around in circles with stuff, with these fly inventions and stuff that I did. And then all of a sudden, I could see it there, and it would be 3 o'clock in the morning. I would get up and make that fly at that time. Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, over the years that, that's the only time we have quiet time. Yeah, you're right. You know, you're right. and if you're really passionate about something, really your your creative thinking comes mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. when you're alone, yeah. and driven by this insatiable desire to do something better. Yeah. Um, talk about your life as a fly tire. I mean, today at 84, I walk into your home and there are flies everywhere, designs <laughs> everywhere, framed flies, and your back room is just inundated with uh, mm -hmm. feathers and hooks and designs. Yeah. So still, you know, 70 years later, you're still driven yeah. by flies. What's yeah. new as a designer in, uh, in today's world? Materials. Different, trying different materials to, to make them look like the unnaturals and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a believer in the natural furs. Buck, bucktail, chicken feathers, uh, rabbit fur, muskrat fur. I'm not happy with the synthetics. There is some synthetics that if you change design styles of tying, that do attract fish, but there's still nothing like the deer tail hair and the fibers of a chicken feather sticking out the back of a fly. There's still nothing that attracts any better than that, I think. I'm still thinking that way. Now, do you tie, I mean, I, you know, so the first flies I saw were these beautiful musky flies, mm -hmm. and, and you have a great passion for musky as well, right? Yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, what about the Northeast, uh, you know, bass stuff? I know that Popovich is a great friend. I think that you mm -hmm. mentioned at one point he was one of your mentors. Yeah, the uh, the, the fly that that I think is still very popular today, because we sell a lot of them here, is the Clouser Lefty Cray mixture of the half and half. That's where I tie the rear half of the fly that looks like a deceiver, and then I put a clouser minnow in front of that. That has become the most favorite striper bass fly ever designed. Wow. Yeah. 
And do you remember when you came up with that design? <laughs> yeah, it was probably in the late 80s. Right. I, I would say around 18 or 1989, somewhere in that neighborhood. Did Lefty have a part of that uh, oh, creativity? Man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he loved it. I did it for him. Did he say, tie it this way? No, I said, looky, Fish it this way. I said, looky here, bud. This is for you and me. And he looked at that and he goes, wow, that's going to work. That, that's why you call it the half and half? <laughs> yeah, I called it the half and half. And yeah. he named your Clouser Mineral yes, for you. Yeah. yeah, that was funny too. I said, Lefty, what are we going to call these things? Well, he said, that's easy, Bobby. He said, look at it. It goes deep, okay? Deep. Tied by Clouser. Deep Clouser Minnow or the Clouser Deep Minnow. And that's what he settled on. And after it got to be the Clouser Deep Minnow, he called me one day and he said, Bobby, they're calling it the Clouser. Can you imagine that? They're, this is going to be around a long time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How long ago was that? 1985 is when it all started. How many, how many of these uh, Clouser Minnows have you sold now? <laughs> is, is there a company that's selling them commercially, or are they mostly yeah, coming from you? Yeah, Rainy, Rainy Flies Company has a uh, kind of a contract with me, and they, they make them and sell them, and then I, I make them and you sell still them, them. Yeah, so oh, a couple thousand you. a year. Talk up to uh, you know our viewers about um, one of the things that um, – I got a couple quotes here uh, from Lefty. Bobby can break down any animal from its ass to its eyeballs with his <laughs> eyes closed and one hand behind his back. Yeah. So you were a butcher. Uh, 26 years of that. When when I started uh, tying flies and stuff for my dad and hunting and fishing and all, I was actually a butcher for Acme Markets in Middletown, PA. Uh, <clears throat> I was an apprentice. I, I got into all three departments, grocery, produce, and meat. I never left the meat department. I love that. Uh, cutting up beef, uh, I have went to farms, and I actually, I hate to say the word, but I, I dispatched an animal to for the farmer to right. eat and cut him up and stuff like that. And, uh, I had a... Uh, in, in my yard at home in Pennsylvania, I had a small butcher shop, just a little uh, shed that my dad had built out of cinder block. I went and I bought a big fan refrigeration unit, I built a, a hanging shed on the side of that where we hung the, the deer, the carcasses, carcasses, and I cut deer and I was butchering between 200 and 275 deer every deer hunting season. Wow. I love when you're in the woods, um, when you harvest an animal, when you start the sound of separating, you know, the hide yeah. from the meat. You bet. You know, that crispy cut. Mm -hmm. um, what are, let's talk about some of the best fishing trips you, you've been on. Whether every, it be with every, Flip. Every one I made. What stands out the, the, the most? What's the best uh, window of your life traveling and fishing? I, what I, was that like? I got I to gotta say this. When I went somewhere, I took a friend or a buddy. When I seen the smile on their face from the trip, that's what satisfied me. That's probably one of the, one of the reasons I like to guide. It's one of the reasons I took people on trips because I wanted to see their satisfaction of enjoying what I enjoyed all them years. Uh, You're a giver. I, I mean, it, it just overwhelms me to go with somebody and he comes home, calls his buddy, and says... I got an 85 pound tarpon this week. Or, or are we on a, a musky trip? And his happiness is not landing that musky. 
We had this muskie follow to the boat, took the fly as I was ready to take it out of the water. I'll never forget that. Those are the little things that mean a lot to anybody that's fishing more so than just landing that fish and talking about it. The little things in between. I have a musky memory that I will never forget. I still laugh about it. Uh, this musky come off the bank a side of a log, and I didn't see him. I knew there was one over there because a guy told me, but I threw the fly, stripped it back, and when I picked it up to make another cast, there he is, right there where my fly was, and he was hauling ass. <laughs> he come and, and couldn't stop. He went underneath the boat and run into the mud bank and stuck in the mud bank. <laughs> stuck his head in the mud and actually made four or five swishes with his tail till he backed out. Oh my God, what a bite. What a bite that missed. And I'm going like, boy, was I dumb. I should have left that fly in the water. Just like <laughs> that, you know, you think of that. But that was the most comicalest thing I've ever seen a fish do in my life. And he was moving. I mean, it was like there and here, all instant and just in a split second, and he was sticking in that bank and in there shaking his body. And he was probably three or four feet long. Wow. <laughs> um, what ocean fish do you like or did you like um, between the stripers and bone fishing and tarpon fishing that you did? Did you gravitate to anything specifically? Well, I used to do a lot of trips for bonefish. Uh, I like I like the flats type fishing. Uh, I never wanted to do any deep sea stuff where you had right. lines had to be sunk, and you know I, I like to look at the fish to cast to them. Right, uh, I love that. Uh, uh, I can tell you a couple of big tarpon stories that's going to make you laugh. Probably, I don't hope it makes somebody else laugh. Is that me and my friend Tom Whittle was in the Casablanca, Mexico. <clears throat> Tom was up on the front deck with his, with his uh, bonefish rod. I'm in the middle watching. I'm looking around for other fish. And here we see coming, this was a, a 200 yards or so away, this big black shadow snaking his way up along the edge. I went, oh, my God, a 100-pound tarpon. This is July, and it's hot. I don't want him. <laughs> I said, Tom, and about that time, the guide goes, big tarpon coming. Get 12 weight. Tom's up on the deck, and I reached down, and Tom turned around, and he goes, huh, too hot. <laughs> now the tarpon is within casting range. He comes past the boat at 30 feet away. Left him go. We both left him go. The guide says, huh, gringo's afraid of big fish. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> and, and I just looked at him and I went, no, too tired to fight big fish. <laughs> I tell you. But that was, uh, that was my buddy, Tom Will. He went on a lot of trips. Uh, he was on a trip with me. Uh, I think it was the same area, Casablanca. Uh, Lefty had an article to write about circle hooks, and I was sent down to test these things. So I called Tom, and I had a group coming in the following week. <clears throat> I called Tom. I said, Tom, we, we can go to the camp a week before the cr uh, crowd comes down. Do you want to go along? Yeah. He come along with me. Now, this was, we only fished circle hooks, and this was one whole week. <laughs> You're going to laugh at this one, too. The guy that I was with, every day we come back, had a meeting with the other guides. <laughs> now, listen to this, man. Every night we come in, we put more fish in the boat. We landed more tarpon more snook and big 
big bonefish, big stuff. Because we fish deep holes with these circle hooks. Uh, we, we use some for sight fishing, but we fish the deep water for the big fish. Every night, we broke some kind of records on these circle hooks down there. The uh, Friday before our other other crew came in, the uh, guides all had a meeting on circle hooks. Come back the next day, and I got out in the morning, and uh, the guide says, Bob, we all know like circle hook. And I said, what's the reason? Well, we can't holler, set the hook, set the hook. <laughs> That's really funny. I, well, looked, I looked at Tom, and Tom laughed, and uh, I said, okay, that's your reason. <laughs> you know, we had a super tweak. Uh, uh, we had some snook that were probably 35 pounds caught in deep water on 10 weight rods. Uh, I had uh, one, or no, Tom had one snook. This thing was an immense snook, and we seen him laying. He's, we seen him coming out of the mangroves. I'm going to tell you a little about calling fish too. To uh, the fish came out of the mangroves, laid under this mangrove bush, and Tom just dropped that fly down, and it, the snook comes out and he goes, ah, sucked it right in. Tom sets the hook. The fish goes underneath the boat and broke the twelve weight in four pieces. Mm. <laughs> the 12 weight broke right at the gunnel where it first hit the thing and then it broke down at the bottom of the boat where it went under the boat it was two big two places that it broke <laughs> and we never landed the snook so we couldn't get no pictures and the guy says gringos no don't know how to fight big fish <laughs> And we laughed at they're, that. they're afraid of them they don't know how to fight them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyhow but we're laughing and we're having a good time. And uh, uh, what I wanted to tell you, it slipped my mind right now. Uh, it'll, I'll be able to come back to it in a minute, so. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, <laughs> so the circle hooks were really good hooks. Why have they not made it into the mainstream of fly fishing? I still have some back there tied. I, I still use them. I use them here on the baby tarpon. But why? I mean, I see all your hooks. How come they're not all tied on, on circle hooks? Because, if, because, do you think circle hooks are better? No, because I sell them better. <laughs> 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 but that being said, you guys did this whole test session with circle hooks, and they, they're better than a J-hook, you think? And up to a certain point, yes. Uh, we we landed way more fish. You gotta you you can't strike. You gotta let him run off, and they, get this, tight. The key is the fish has to turn. If the fish doesn't turn, nothing happens. The fly right. just pulls out of his mouth. Right. But that's the key to 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 watch the fish. Let him run off, and if if he would turn tails to you, he's hooked right away. But how many fish don't turn when they bite? A lot. Such as? <laughs> I can tell you a joke here. Yeah. Uh, this this was in Boca Pala, Mexico, when I had circle hooks on when we were trying to. This was a year before we wrote the article. I threw a clouser minnow. In, in, in a little deep hole of the sand was a baby tarpon. I mean, a baby baby, mm -hmm. probably 15 inches long. Laying there, I shot the fly in alongside of him, pulled it out, dropped it right in front of him. He stands there and he goes, down, sucks it in, and just stops dead. Looking at me. I'm going, turn, go, go somewhere, go on, go on. Right. And I just lifted the rod up and the fly come out of his mouth. Right. I threw another cast in there. Stripped it out, hit the sand in front of him, moved it. He come over and he sucked it up. Never moved. And I said, that fish will never get caught on a circle hook. Right. If he keeps doing that the rest of his life, 
But that's a rare fish. I mean, yeah. typically, yeah. I mean, you see trout come up and sip yeah. flies, yeah. and they go straight back down. Yep. Yeah. But of all the fish I've caught, typically, once they grab that fly, they turn. Oh. Somet- sometimes a tarpon on the flat will come up and sip a fly and keep coming straight at you. Yeah, that. that. And at that point, you've got to, you know, I just strike as hard as I can and get the tip of the hook stuck, and I stomp on the boat. And then yeah. when that tarpon yeah. turns, I lower the rod and set the hook. That makes him move, that stomping. Yeah. yeah. But for the most part, most fish eat and turn. Yeah. Maybe bonefish will, 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 will pin it on the bottom. I, I've but, had bonefish come up and, and on a tandem white little clouser. As I'm stripping it, he's going like this. I can see him grabbing the fly but not turning with that turning right but then all of a sudden he goes like that and he's hooked right he's so you can't pull until he's pulling the other way right right it's it's a it's a game that's got to be learned by the guy fishing them right and also he has to learn what fish he's fishing for and how they do when they take something a uh, smallmouth bass is instantly hooked with a circle. He goes, <clears throat> right. But if you go to any fly fishing bins and even bait bait stores, yeah. the circle hook is less than 5% of the hooks that you see, you know, in it's, the bins. It's less than 5% sold. Why is that? <laughs> the guys don't believe in them. I mean, offshore fishing, all the bill fishermen, the Billfish Foundation, it's like almost this, like a, uh, it's a prerequisite. That this it's buddy, a legal thing. You got to fish with circle hooks for this, billfish. This good buddy of mine, Tom Whittle, when he come back, he has never used another hook in his life. And he's a striper fisherman in Delaware. And he says... Once you learn how to use these, Bob, you'll never go back. Right. And and he's correct on that. But but I'm in the business where I talk to a lot more people than just one guy fishing one area. And they don't work everywhere. Mm-hmm. And also, you got to have confidence in that thing. Right. And you also, you've also got to have patience in waiting for oh. that, 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 that hook to get tight. We would sit in that boat, and we played with that tarpon, I think it was four casts, and we laughed at him every cast and said, I said, Tom, he's never, ever going to get caught on a circle hook. <laughs> because he, he, He's not doing anything. He lay there, and he'd spit it out, this, facing us, and just spit this fly right out. So. <laughs> um, how? Let's talk about this this generation right now, these last number of years have been, you know, a big change in your life, a change in all of our lives. Mm-hmm. You lost your first wife, Joan, about five years yep. ago. Then jo- then COVID hit right after yep. that. Yep. How traumatic has this transition been? I, I think it's been worrisome. Uh, I didn't let it put me down. I didn't worry about it. Uh, I went to the doctors right away, got the pre-medicine I was supposed to take. I got all my shots. Uh, Jackie done the same thing. Uh, She got all her stuff. And we fought through it. Right. And we stayed clean. We washed our hands. We kept the house as clean as possible uh, using... uh, uh, detergents that would kill those type of uh, viruses right and uh, and we made it through uh, right. i've lost a bunch of friends through that uh, and another thing is i just feel lucky sometimes <laughs> well you you deserve to be lucky but you're also smart and but i'm interested in the transition that you made um after your first wife passed, after 63 years of being married, and now you've got a new woman in your life. Uh, I think your story is a great inspiration for a lot of people out there that are at your age. Uh, there is great joy oh. still if you just you know have perseverance and keep believing, if I'm yeah, not mistaken, yeah. right? I, I cannot say anything bad about my previous wife. But this lady that I'm living with now is a completely different human being. Uh, She had lost a husband. 
uh, she went through some of the stuff that I did. Uh, she has a, a real brain. I mean, she is super smart, uh, well-educated, uh, a family person. She has some children. Uh, and that day at Rossetti's, when I met her in, in the, the, the office part there, and I was chewing on some chicken wings. <laughs> She said to me, you need somebody in your business that can take care of your business. She says, I love to fish, hunt, fly cast, tie flies, and I'm an IT person. She said, what else do you want? <laughs> I said, okay, Jackie, uh, I'm going to think about this. I went home. I left the event and went home. I started calling her on the phone. And we're getting kind of chummy on the phone and stuff. And we're kidding each other about some things. And I said, Jackie, 30 years is way too much difference for an old man like me. I don't care. She said, that's not important to me. I want companionship. I want somebody I can go fishing with. I want somebody I can sit down and tie flies with. I want to help you. I kept calling her on the phone. And then we started talking at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Jackie, you're talking me into it. I'm going to buy a one-way airplane ticket down to see you. I bought a one-way ticket down here. I guess it was probably April of one year. And I've been here ever since. Wow. She's your angel. Yeah. She's everything. Everything that a man in his whole entire life should have. Well, and, and I got her. Well, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Yep. Um, I'd like to, we've been jumping around a little bit because I don't want to forget things and I go back and forth because um, that's the way my mind goes. Yeah, <laughs> I have a hard I, time tracking stuff. I but, but I think I've, I first met you at maybe a Somerset uh, trade show when I first started traveling up there. Yeah. What were those shows like in the early years and all your buddies going there? I mean, obviously, you had your own shop. Um, you were an innovator. Uh, you had relationships with flight companies. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like to go there and have see all your buddies um, that time of year? It, it, it was just, uh, I would say, an overwhelming event. Exciting. Uh, good to go to, good to see your friends, uh, watch the improvement in a lot of things, uh, do a lot of casting different rod companies. Uh, I got to I gotta say one thing here, and I don't want the audience to think bad about me and Lefty, because we're for everybody. We, we might belong to a rod company. Okay. That sells three, four hundred dollar rods. In my shop, my young clients could not afford those rods. Lefty and I sold more Cortland and St. Croix rods than any two men on this planet to get the young folks into the port. They would come in my shop and go out there with an $89 Cortland fly rod and a, a real suitable and good and durable on that rod with a good line, come back five years later and buy a $500 fly rod. Right. Every one of them customers done that. Right. If, it w if we would have tried to sell them $500 fly rods, they'd have walked out of our shop. Right. Well, it's, a, it's a, obviously a, uh, it's a progression an opportunity that yeah. we've all had. Yeah. Uh, but 
One of the things that, that when I first got there, getting to know all you guys and Ed Jarowski and <laughs> oh, Lefty. God. Oh, God. I mean, we used to, towards the end of Lefty's life, every trade show, yeah. we would spend an hour and a half to two hours every day, and, and Ed would get on his computer and talk about the fly lines and the energy transferred. Mm -hmm. You don't have um, great... Um, transfer of ideas unless you're at a trade show like that with the best minds in the game uh who was who was your the guy that you gravitate to that that uh, i mean to me ed jorowski was yeah. in, it was a genius it was it was if ed, i'm not mistaken ed had the had the really dynamics behind um ed, the, the actual movement of a fly line ed ed and i are good friends and we've been together for years Ed is the smartest man in this business. I agree. He can tell you from the butt to the tip how fly rod's going to cast just by looking at it in somebody else's hand. We don't have people like that anymore. Uh, we have, and I'm starting to get nasty here, we're calling them one of beers. We have somebody that wants to be famous before they even know anything. Lefty had a saying about this. All he do would look at me and me, Bobby Popovics and Jairoski and and say Help him. <laughs> this is slime. <laughs> it's okay. And he would say to us guys, they don't know what they don't know. Lefty would say that. Yes. And he was he's right. They're, they're trying to make you believe that they know everything, but they don't know nothing. What they don't know. Here's, here's one of the great things that uh, I read about is that you saw uh, Lefty casting. <laughs> And you said something like, he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to help me. Yeah. What, is, what were those words? And where were you when you saw Lefty On Castle? the Susquehanna River. Uh, he was up there in his boat. And I'm throwing popping bugs. And you don't know each other yet? No, don't know each other. And I'm watching this guy, and I'm going, holy shit, look at that. <laughs> He doesn't know he's going to be helping me here pretty soon. I started my engine, went over to the boat, and I said, Sir, who are you? He said, Bob. Uh, no, he didn't say Bob. He said, I'm from Maryland. My name's Lefty. And I said, Are you Lefty Cray, the famous fly caster and stuff? I said, well, hey, here, look, I'm Bob Clouser, and I need your help. <laughs> and from that day on, he, he somehow, we got together and it became a friendship. You know, not, not a buddy type thing, but I mean a real friendship. Right. We never intimidated each other. Lefty didn't intimidate me because I wanted to learn what he wanted and he taught it. And then we became good friends. And he said to me one, I said to him one day, I said, Lefty, tell me something. What the hell is my attraction to you? Well, Bobby, it's pretty simple. He said, you're from Pennsylvania. You're different than all the Pennsylvania fly fishermen I've ever met. I said, what's the difference? He says, you don't hide your fly in your hand when you're holding your fly rod. Think about that. Just think about it. You don't hold your fly in I your don't hand. Hi I don't hide my oh, hide fly. Because you're not afraid to see who sees it Yeah. in that regard. Yeah. You want to share. Yeah. Yeah. And left you as a sharer. Yeah. Whereas, uh, <laughs> you know, with all due respect to Lefty, the casting brains of Lefty, was that the action of Jarowski's uh, the guy, mind? The guy that... Because that, I know they Ed, worked very closely Ed, together. Ed had, Ed had a lot 
to teach Lefty, okay? He taught him a lot. But his best teacher was Irv Swope. I I had the the, the the luck to babysit with Irv. Lefty called me one day and he said, Bobby, Irv, Irv, Irv is holding me back on my when I go somewhere, I have. He's getting old. He, he says I, I can't be held back. I have. To, I can't be interrupted. And he said, "Can you take her somewhere when I have to go someplace?" I said, "Yeah, just call me and tell me when." So we started taking Herb up up to Downsville for trout fishing, fly dry fly time. And I walked down to the stream with Herb. And we stuck some dry flies on. I think they were red quills. And he's standing with trees in a background, I mean, right up against him. He's throwing the entire fly line and the fly straight across the creek without roll casting. Or back cast? How do you do that? I'm watching him. I'm going, okay, here's something. Lefty never showed me this. He would take and throw the front cast down this way, turn around, and go like this. He would. Uh, he was that slow. He was pulling the line through the cast instead of casting. Mm, interesting. Go like this, and he'd pull that line right over here and go like that, and it would go right across the creek never touched the limbs in back of him and i'm going i got to learn that so that was one of our little things that he showed me and irv uh, irv is probably uh, him and joe brooks are probably the two guys that were the mentors of lefty yeah for sure way back. lefty speaks about joe brooks yeah oh my god podcast. yeah yeah um do you know, have you read the book, The Feather Thief? No. Well, being a fly tire, it's an interesting book, and I'll make it brief. Yeah. Edwin Rist uh, was a, uh, a musician, mm -hmm. a very talented prodigy, ended up in England. Somehow, he got involved with tying Atlantic salmon flies, not even a fisherman. And all the Atlantic salmon flies are tied with ex exotic feathers, as you know exotic birds some are are extinct and yeah. he goes and finds out that a lot of these extinct birds are in the museum this one particular museum in, in outside of london and he can't nobody can get these feathers but now he's a passionate fly tire oh my God. it became one of the best in the world at yeah. it breaks into the museum and steals all these exotic birds out of the museum and starts <laughs> selling the feathers online and come to find out He's at Somerset, <laughs> the okay. same show we were all at. Oh my God! Chasing down fly tires and feathers, and I thought being a, a fly tire yourself, this I, is a book you I, might love to read. It's I fast, will. It's a fascinating I read. I definitely will. So yeah, um, where do you have anything that you'd like to add about your life and your friendships with Flip and and Lefty and all these guys? I mean, it was a real yeah. camaraderie. In the fly, in the fishing world, without question, every every, every place we fished together, we had a super time, no competition. Right, it was just all fun, uh, laughing at each other's fish. We kept taking pictures of each other, holding the fish up. Just an enjoyable weekend. Right, know, and that. Uh, can I make one little break here now? Absolutely. Jackie just walked in the door. Oh, awesome. Jackie. Come on in, Jackie. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bob, um, your name, Bob Clouser, uh, is in the history books for the rest of time with your contributions, with your fly tying, your influence, your casting, your guiding, your shop, uh, all your pals, the two books that you've written. Um, I'd like to just say thank you for joining us and, and sharing your story. And one last question, how would you like to be remembered? I I I just I can't say I I I don't really know. Uh, 
I would like to be remembered, this is the guy that helped a lot of people enjoy what I enjoyed in my life. That's that's pretty simple, I guess. I don't know. I don't have no idea anything else that I want. Right. Well, you've uh, you shared a, a lot of love. I mean, when you meet Bob Clouser, you have a big <laughs> smile and a big laugh and a monster heart. And okay, that's good. I, I'd just like to say thank you for being a friend and, oh, yeah. and sharing your story with you, us today. You, you bet, Andy. No sweat. We've been around the block a little bit, you yeah. and I. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm the guy that stumbles going around the block <laughs> at my age anymore. Well, I'm right with you. <laughs> Trust me. Bob, thank you so much. We hey, really buddy, it. it's, it's a pleasure. You know yeah, that. Man. Love you. you bet. Like love everybody you else. Yeah, love you too. Thanks, pal. When I saw it's West Side Story, when I saw it's just a word.